Hi, I'm Charles Warren. I'm a, a user experience designer on mobile. And welcome. Thanks for coming. I want to introduce Laura Allen, who for many years has been a champion of gray water out of Oakland. She was the founder of Gray Water Gorillas. Um, you may be aware that it, was, it used to not be strictly legal to use gray water for irrigation, so um, she led a lot of the work that got the, those policy changes and things done. We're very happy to have her. And, and Greg Bullock uh, is a contractor and installer who builds these systems, and he's going to talk about some of the, re, the ways um, you can go about thinking through whether a gray water system makes sense for you. And I think they've got us, they're going to lay down the gauntlet for, for uh, us Googlers. So without uh, further ado, take it away, Laura and Greg. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm Laura. I'm a co-founder of Greywater Gorillas, now known as Greywater Action. Before we start talking about Greywater, I want to think about, we're just going to think about water for a sec. So I have a couple of cups of water over here. And I want you to, so the first one represents a country. It's totally full. It's got 156 gallons of water in it. Anyone want to guess what country might use this amount per day? This is per capita use. Yeah, the United States. Uh, this other cup, this represents a continent now. And this is representing about 88 gallons per person per day. This is just residential use, cooking, drinking, watering the landscape not agriculture, not industry. Anyone want to guess what continent might use this much? Yep, Europe. <laughs> Europe on average uses about half as much as Americans use, and England is a really low water user. They use about 40 gallons per person per day. Um, so now this cup, this is another continent. It's representing 22 gallons per person per day. Any guesses? Yeah, Asia, yep. Now we have another continent. This is 12 gallons per person per day. Any guesses? It's Africa. And the last one, this is one of the lowest water using countries in the entire world. It's representing 1.3 gallons of water per person per day. Any guesses? Country. It's a country, yeah. You're close. Yeah, it's, it's Gambia. So it's one of the lowest water users in the world. So we just wanted to start with you know, how much water we do use. In the United States, we have, a lot, we have a lot of water, and we use a lot. And so we're excited to talk about some better ways to use that water. Thanks, Laura. OK, so just picking up off that theme, a few more questions for you. Um, anybody want to have a guess at what the uh, recommended amount of uh, water per person uh, is recommended for basic sanitation and health needs per person? Charles, you should know this one. Yeah. <laughs> 13 gallons. How many people worldwide um, have no access to any water within a 15 minute radius of their homes? One billion people. And how many gallons of raw or partially treated sewage flows into US waterways per year? Oh, exactly. <laughs> OK, and final, final quiz, and then we'll get on to some more content. That's, that's everything, yeah. That's the whole management system across the country, yeah. Um, final quiz. Who said whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over? Fighting for. Any guesses? Mark Twain said that. OK, back to you, Laura. So um, to start talking about gray water, there was a really excellent report that came out um, last year looking at the how can gray water really meet our needs. 
and it's a non-potable source of water. So if we look at how it can meet our irrigation needs, we can find that it actually matches up really well. So those two charts, if you just look at shower and laundry water, these are kind of average per capita use in California. And then you look at the outdoor use for landscaping, there's a really good match. So we can just take all that water instead of sending it to the sewer plant, which often you know, doesn't treat it properly. Often it does, but not always. We can use that to irrigate outside things that don't need potable water. And another thing to of note is, you know, how much water is this? Like, you know, each household gray water system, like, does it really, will it really impact California water? And if we look at, the, this is millions of gallons per day of savings. If people take that water and irrigate outside, you can look at just from washing machines, how many millions of gallons you'd save, showers and washers, and then all gray water. And I wanted to point you to one number, that 10% column. If just 10% of people in, this is just Southern California, reuse their gray water, to irrigate plants outside, that would offset the need for a medium-sized desalinization plant. So instead of you know, looking for new sources of water, we can look for this source we already have. Um, so getting into gray water, one of the first questions is, is this legal? Like, can I do this legally? And the regulations around gray water have been changing over the last couple of decades. Gray water used to be viewed as sewage. It was part of just the, the whole water stream going down out of the house, considered sewage dangerous. You can't reuse it. And slowly over time, it's been shifted to be seen as a resource to be able to be used for non-potable sources. So in California, we were the first state to have a code. It was written in 1992. And it was a code, it's a plumbing code, um, designed to allow people to reuse gray water. But the way it was written, it really was more of a disposal code. And so people weren't able to do that, to use actually reuse it. They were kind of asked to dispose of it deep under the ground. And so between 1992 and 2009, pretty much all gray water systems were done without a permit, which were, they were technically illegal, because the code really wasn't in line with why people wanted to use it, how it was practical to use. And so there's millions of unpermitted systems. And Last year, a, big, a lot of, there was drought, there was a lot of pressure of reducing water, and so there was a, a big push to rewrite the code and make it actually fit with gray water being a resource. And so the Department of Housing and Community Development wrote a new code, and a lot of people were involved in that to really make it so we could use gray water as a resource. And so from last year and onward to the future, gray water is seen as a resource, and we're going to show you some simple and legal ways that you can reuse it. Yeah. We'll get to that in one second. Yeah, good. It's actually right, right here. So gray water, who's heard of gray water? All of you. Does anyone have a gray water system? Not yet. Anyone interested? A couple of you, yeah. So gray water, it's from sinks, showers, and washing machines. So it's water that's a little bit dirty, but it's not too dirty to water plants. It's never from toilets, and it's not from washing diapers. So it doesn't have fecal matter in it. It's not, not like the toilets, which would be not safe to reuse. Kitchen sinks, it depends on what state you live in, if it's considered gray water or not. In California, kitchen sinks are not allowed to be, we're not allowed to reuse that water legally. So I want to break gray water into uh, three ways. Um, the first one is for outdoor use. This is just taking the gray water, sending it outside. You're taking a shower. It's going out just directly and irrigating your plants. So that's the simplest way to use it. It's low tech. We try not to have pumps or filters or things that require maintenance um, and mechanical devices. The second way is also for outdoor use, but this is a little different. It's taking gray water and sending it through a drip irrigation system, which is a lot more complicated because gray water has hair in it, has lint, it has little you know, chunks of things. It's a little gunky, and so if you want to send that to drip irrigation, you're going to have to really filter it and get all the particles out. And so then you just have a much more complex system. So it's a really different way to use the water. And then the third way is indoor use, and so that's for non-potable uses such as toilet flushing and possibly laundry washing. And it's also a lot more complicated to get gray water back inside because it has to be filtered and disinfected and it's pumped and you know, it's connected to the domestic water supply. And it's really just a whole other level of system. Um, it's also not really allowed under the new code in any practical way. And so it's definitely um, a good resource for bigger scale projects like commercial buildings. For residential, it's usually not very appropriate. And so when you're thinking about any type of gray water system, the soaps and the products you use really matter because now that water is going to your plants. So there's a couple things you want to avoid. Um, you want to avoid any salt compound. Salts, you know, sodium, all of that will damage the soil and damage your plants. You want to avoid boron or borate. That's also going to damage your plants. And chlorine bleach is obviously, you know, it kills things, so you don't want to send it outside. 
The next thing to kind of just get a little more informed is, is a lot of, there's a lot of chemicals in our personal care products that are really just not good for us. And it's not really a plant issue or a gray water issue, but it's often a good time when people are going to reuse their water. They want to think about, well, what, what's in this stuff I'm using? And so if you're interested in doing a little more research, there's a database. It's called cosmeticdatabase.org. And you can enter any product and it'll tell you what's in it. You know, things are, oftentimes it's kind of shocking to do this. Have any of you guys tried this? Not yet. No, I, I said it's it's frightening. So be be ready if you if you want to go down that route. But it's definitely informative. You can find out all sorts of things about the products. Um, and then the other thing is there's there's products that are recommended. So if you don't want to do lots of research, you know we we can tell you what products that we've researched and found to have no salt, no boron, boron, and not a lot of other carcinogenic things that are in a lot of products. So there's just a few examples, like Oasis, Biopack, Ecos, Aubrey Organics. There's more, too. So I'm going to talk about kind of some basic things with gray water. And this is just for the first way, the outdoor simple systems. And a lot of times it's really, gray water is its unique source of irrigation. So the kind of common sense knowledge with other types of irrigation don't really fit with gray water. So it's important to kind of understand it and see the different kind of do's and don'ts with gray water irrigation. So the do's, the things you want to do is mulch is a really important um, component of a system. Do you guys know what mulch is? Yeah, it's just like wood chips, you know, things covering up your landscape, so it's covering the soil. Mulch is really important for gray water. Um, you also, you, you always want to have a way to go back to the sewer. It's called a three-way valve, and Greg's going to show you an example in a sec. You want to use plant-friendly products, because it's going outside. Um, and then you want to use, I put a proven design in quotes, because there's, you know, so many different ways you could get your water outside, and there's lots of ways people can tinker and, you know, get it to get, go out there. But if you use a design that other people have tried and you can just get some recommendations, it tends to work better and have less problems. So now we have the don'ts. The first don't is um, a very common error. Don't store gray water. Um, you, if you store it, it has nutrients in it. It has you know, little pieces of gunk and stuff. It'll start to break down, and it'll basically start to smell very bad. So you don't ever want to have it in a container and store it for later. You also use gray, make gray water every day, so there's no reason, practical reason to store it. You don't want to have a filter that you have to actually fit manually clean, because that's just a, a point of failure. People forget to clean things uh, if you need to have regular maintenance, so that's a, not a good idea. You don't want to use it if you're near a creek or a river. It um, has nutrients in it, and those nutrients can actually pollute. It's like a fertilizer, so if that gets into the water, it will cause algae to grow and to rob the, the creek or river of oxygen. So some sites are just not appropriate for gray water. And you also don't want to use it if you don't have very good drainage on your site, because you, don't, you never want to have pooling of gray water or it running off. You need to make sure it can soak properly into the ground to irrigate plants. And so the next thing, a mulch basin. Who's heard of a mulch basin? That one person. Yeah, this is a kind of a common-ish landscaping technique to uh, be water conserving. It's making, putting mulch around trees. It lets, um, so what you do with the mulch basin is you go to the drip line of the tree and you remove some soil, kind of like a donut ring of soil removed, and you fill it up with wood chips instead. And this allows, if with gray water, when you um, are going to irrigate with gray water, it goes into that mulch basin. It can spread out through all those wood chips. It gets actually kind of filtered in the wood chips naturally, and it soaks down into the ground and you never see it, it doesn't pool or run off. It's just going underground and irrigating. So it's probably the most important piece of a gray water system, and it's not often spoken of because it's you know, out in the landscape. It's not a pipe, it's not a plumbing part, it's something you do to your landscape. But it's really important to have a well-functioning gray water system. And so as that gray water goes into the landscape, the other really critical thing is something that you don't really see. It's the billions of microscopic soil bacteria that are in the, in the soil. They're consuming nutrients. They're taking any kind of gunky, dirty whatever's in your gray water and turning it into plant nutrients. So they're really critical for a gray water system. And you don't actually have to do anything. You just need to have healthy soil. And I just want to show you my favorite one. Um, this is a, you know, sort of not an exactly realistic picture. It's a microscopic organism. This one is called the tardigrade. Have any of you heard of the tardigrade? Now this little bitty microscopic organism went into space and it survived space. It forms, turns itself into a cyst and can survive pretty much anything. It came back to Earth and reproduced. So these things are, you know, in the soil there's really um, strong and um, organisms that can do just about anything like survive space. So we don't, if we get our gray water going into healthy soil, we don't have to worry so much about the nutrients in it and the gunky stuff. Thanks. So the tardigrades are going to save us, you guys. 
Okay, we're going to take a, a little bit of a deeper dive now and focus on one particular system, uh, the laundry to landscape system. And I think the value of, of taking a focus on this one is this is considered like the low hanging fruit of gray water systems. It's a great place to start. And I'll just run you through at a very high level here how it's done. Um, firstly, obviously, as Laura had mentioned, we have to be careful about what detergents or soaps we use in the first place. We have to use non-toxic ingredients. And then we can reuse that water that's coming out of the washing machine, divert it, and I'll show you some parts here in a minute, out to the landscape and grow food with it or shelter, or a beautiful backyard oasis. Really whatever we desire in terms of our backyard spaces or front yard landscapes for that matter. Here's a little deeper dive. Oops, excuse me. This is a schematic of a laundry to landscape system. It shows you how the plan would work in effect. Um, obviously it's showing the, um, the collection plumbing here that distributes out to the landscape. Um, thank you, out to the landscape, and actually um, emits the water directly into the soil, and that connects with the mulch basins that we just heard Laura talk to. So the beauty of this system is that, well, for one, it has a built-in pump. It uses the pump of the washing machine. So if there are any distribution challenges, um, maybe you have a slight incline, um, there are, there are some ways to overcome those challenges because you have this built-in pump. Apart from that, no additional gadgetry is required, no filters to break down, which is wonderful. So if this is a design, well-designed system up front, uh, this system will never fail over time. Uh, a very low-tech but high-effective solution. Um, some rough estimates, this is a doable system for a somewhat handy homeowner. Uh, it's not for everybody, but, but can be done. Um, material cost would run between $100 to $200 uh, if you were willing to do this yourselves. Uh, if you wanted a professional install, a good rule of thumb would be about $700 to, up to about $2,000, depending on the size, complexity of, of the job. Um, one thing quickly to know, grey water systems are very site specific, it's very situational, so it's important to kind of you know, do those assessments up front and, and obviously have um, a fair idea whether grey water is a practical solution for your, for your own backyard. Here's some pictures, and just while we're looking at this, let me hand out some parts for you guys. This is a useful pass those around. This is a three way brass valve. Um, it's really considered like the heart of a laundry to landscape system. And it gives us the ability to turn our system on to take the water out to the landscape or to turn it off or if you like back to the sewer line if we're washing those dirty diapers or we're using bleach uh, or you know, any other potential health risks that, that you know, may come from pathogens in that water. So it's important to have that facility to turn it on and off. Um, other key features to note here, um, the auto vent uh, anti-siphon device actually breaks uh, a vacuum in, in a, uh, a system. And the one inch diameter pipe is important because it's consistent with the hose typically coming out the back of the washing machine. So there's no alterations with water pressure that could create some, you know, perhaps unforeseen problems further down the line. I'm gonna keep it nice, stable, and consistent, and then the system won't let us down. Here's some pictures of an actual installation going on. Um, we can see on the left-hand side here, this is where the water is finally emitted. So these are the actual mulch basins that we talked about. It shows a, an emitter coming out here. Um, the code does require that water, grey water, is emitted two inches below the soil surface. That's a health and safety concern um, that we have to, uh, you know, confide to. Um, what we, uh, kind of a clever um, design on, on this system is that we actually reuse uh, the plant pots that we buy plants from our um, garden centre, uh, cut the tops of them off, uh, cut a little hole about halfway up the plant pot and feed the emitter directly into that. That has a really nice way of obviously protecting the emitters. It keeps it suspended off the ground level so it actually stops any root growth that could over time root grow into search of water and grow into those holes and plug it up. 
Um, and it also keeps it covered and keeps it identified. So over time, you know, there, there will be adjustments that you need to make uh, to your irrigation zone. So this is an easy way to mark them. Uh, what, it, what a lot of people do to make it a bit more aesthetically pleasing is cover it with a rock or a natural stone of some kind. And then you have your markers there and you know exactly where the water's coming out. Um, we do bury and stake the tubing. So once a system is completely installed, obviously there would be no visible piping here. So that's partly buried and then covered with dirt and, and mulch over the top. And the half inch irrigation lines is just a way that we can control pressure and make adjustments if we need to. So the right amount of water gets to the right amount of, of zones that we create. Here's a picture of an uh, example of there's a meter here that's covered under a natural stone that is code compliant because it's not accessible for children or pets. It's two inches underground. And then on the other side there, we can see an example of a non-code compliant. It emits water above ground, which, which isn't legal. And just to wrap up then on this example, this is a great example of atypical uh, laundry to landscape installation. Obviously, we stress the importance here of labeling. Um, that's uh, for you know, education, it's information for those that are you know, less familiar with the system. They can obviously come and see uh, which direction they need to switch the tap. If you're obviously renting a home or you're selling it on, labeling is very important. Um, we can see here a very typical installation where the gray water is, and this is on the far corner, is focused on the trees. Um, so we have six trees, I think, in the yard here, and then a veggie bed in the middle, which is irrigated with fresh water. Um, important point to note there is that um, gray water is legal uh, and completely safe for food grown above the soil surface. So any food like root crops, obviously, that are grown in the ground, gray water isn't uh, advised and it isn't legal uh, for use there. So focus on trees, vines, bushes, <laughs> shrubs. Uh, quick breakdown of cost. Uh, this was a self-install, about $150. Uh, 15 gallon was a high efficiency machine, so that's a 15 gallon load. Uh, obviously calculated how many loads a typical household would do a week, and then distributed based on the soil type, uh, the size and the type of plants, and obviously the climate zone that the, uh, the yard is in. Take me a quick pause there. Any quick questions on, on this particular example? Uh, what about temperature? I think the water is coming out so hot and burn. Yeah, and my experience is hot water to be avoided, particularly for young plants. Let me kind of pull Laura into that too. Do you have any advice on that one? Yeah, when, when it goes through all the piping and then it, after it soaks through the mulch layer and by the time it gets to the roots, it's cooled down a lot. So I've never seen that an issue. But again, you wouldn't water like seedlings or something very small and fragile. These are set up for more perennials and larger plants that have a, a, huge, a big root area. So if by chance it did damage one root, the plant would have thousands of other roots to draw from. So it's really kind of a non-issue. But then we also encourage people to you know, use warm or cold water too. It saves energy. Yeah, definitely. Ecos is a really common brand. The easiest to find that's gray water friendly and it's compatible with all the different types of machines. Sold at Costco. Yeah. Ecos, yeah. It's a little easier. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Team. I just wanted to show two other parts with this. So in the outside, it's a, a tubing. It's a high-density polyethylene, which is kind of a more environmentally friendly plastic. And the emitters Greg was talking about, they're not, they're really different than like a drip emitter. It's actually just an opening. This is a T, so it's one inch by half inch. So it's reduced a little bit, but it's still a half inch opening. So if there was hair or lint or anything, it could fall out there, it wouldn't clog. So a gray water emitter is not gonna be the same as a drip emitter. This is more like an outlet for the water to come through. And then also just wanted to show you kind of a newer product for gray water. Well, it's actually for irrigation, but we're going to start using this. It's called Blue Lock, and it's a, all, all the, the fittings and the tubing is all the high-density polyethylene, which is just a better type of plastic. This is a PVC fitting, which is, you know, PVC is the worst kind of plastic. 
so the next kind of system right now, we're kind of totally jumping to a different type of system. The other system Greg explained was from a washing machine. It was not altering the plumbing. The pump from the machine was just pumping out the water through its hose, and then we just connected to that hose the valve, and so it set up a whole different system. We didn't alter the household plumbing in any way. But this kind of system from showers or sinks, this is drainage plumbing, so you actually have to get under your fixture, so usually under the house in a crawl space, in a basement, maybe on the side of your house if you have external plumbing, and you're actually going to have to alter the plumbing. So it's a totally different type of system, and it has you know different ways it's used. So this system, I'm going to show an example from a shower. Um, this is these all these systems require a permit because you're altering your plumbing. So for this, the first thing you have to do is identify what drain it is. Make sure you have the right one. You're going to cut into that and install. An, it's called a three-way valve, but it actually just goes in two directions. So this one's bigger because with drainage plumbing, the water has to flow by gravity through either inch and a half or two inch pipe. So it's the same concept as the brass one that went around. It's just bigger. Um, this one's made out of plastic. It turn, you turn the handle and it turns off one side or the other. And this one squeaks, so be ready when it comes around. And you can look inside and you see there's a ball that kind of rotates and it shuts off one side or the other. So this would be under your house. You're, you can add a motor to this in case your crawl space is really small and you don't want to crawl down there to turn it. You can add a motor to this and run a switch into your back bathroom, um, that's definitely a possibility. Or if you can access it, you just manually turn it. So when you have that installed, like you can see in that picture number three, the gray water comes in and it can either go to this gray water irrigation side or to the sewer and you just turn that valve whenever you need to. If it's raining outside or if you're going to bleach out your tub or for whatever reason, you don't want it to go outside. So the, I want to describe one kind of shower system. It's called a branch drain. And this one, um, the materials, again, a couple hundred dollars. It's a little more usually than the, the laundry type system. Installation, it depends, you know, 1,000 to 3,000. The, the complexity of it really depends on the yard and the plumbing. And there's a lot of variables. And also, um, let me go back real quick to that other slide. You can imagine if you had a concrete foundation, you can't get under there. So in there's some houses you, and retrofits, you actually can't use this type of gray water system. You have to be able to access the pipes. So assuming you can access your pipes, um, this system is a gravity-based system. So there's, it's just flowing. It doesn't have any storage, and it doesn't have any filters. Again, it's a very um, simple and elegant system. How it works is the water all flows out through one pipe. And because you don't want to send all of your shower water to one plant, you divide it up with flow splitters. So we're using regular ABS drainage plumbing pipe. So it comes in, and this splitter divides the flow equally in half. So you know how now you have half of your water going to one side and half to the other. And then you put in a second one, maybe a third. So you're dividing up your flow into halves, eighths, quarters, sixteenths. And so you'd really want to match how much water do you use and then how much do your plants want. And this is all going to be outside in your landscape. That little white thing is a clean out. You can unscrew it. Um, so here's a picture. This is an installation before the landscaping was done. So you can see the gray water is coming in. The flow splitter is stationary on a brick, so it's level, and then all the rest of the system is sloping down. So you can see that future tree is going to be irrigated on both sides, and that kind of sunken area, that's going to be filled with mulch. So the gray water goes through the mulch. And here's another picture. Um, this one is an existing landscape. So this type of system, it does take a lot of work to install because you're trenching and sloping and making sure it's got a good slope so all the water flows out. But once it's done, it's very, you know, there's really nothing to break, no moving parts. It's just flowing out into your landscape. You're dividing it up. Um, you can see in the on the right side, it's going to four different outlets. That's from a pretty high use sink. So it's going to four different mulch basins with some established fruit trees. And then the end where it terminates to the landscape. Um, that middle picture, um, so it comes into, this is called a valve box. It's an irrigation valve box, and Greg described how to make this out of that plastic planter. You can buy them or you can make them yourself. But the water comes into the middle. This is the ground level, so it's all buried up to here. The water's coming in. It's dropping through the air so roots don't grow in, and then it's soaking down into the ground. And this is a place you can access. You can look in. Um, you could cover this with a stone. Um, you can see on the left. That's an almost finished installation, so the pipe is still slightly exposed coming to that valve box area. It's in the drip line of the tree. And then on the right, that one's totally finished. Everything's covered. There's a, a stone on top. And you really you know, can't see anything <clears throat> except for the, the access point. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. 
Yeah. There's setbacks in the code. There's a whole chart of setbacks. You can't be, I, I believe um, that it's two feet from a building, foot and a half from a property line. There's definitely setbacks. If you're near um, a water source, there's lots of other considerations. So that's the details that you would want to research or ask your installer. Um, so here's a kind of picture of a finished system. This is from one shower. Again, it's all subsurface. There's nothing to see. It's all gravity flowed. There's, you know, just flowing out by gravity and there's no storage. So you're taking a shower. It's being spread up through this branch distribution system under the ground and soaking into the ground. And all those blue arrows represent where the gray water is coming out. In this yard, a bunch of really um, new fruit trees are planted the same time as the installation. So you can see everything's kind of small but all that will get really big. And this is in a front yard, so if people are walking down the street, they would really have no idea that this entire yard is being irrigated by gray water. It's very, you know, subtle and discreet. Does anyone have questions about the branch drain system? Nope. Okay. So just a really quick, some common errors, and this is sort of from the legacy of systems of the past, you know, couple of decades. It's also kind of misappropriating information about other types of irrigation. So common errors are storage tank, like having a big tank to store water, pump zealous, people want to pump to their roof or the top of their property or all over the place, and filters that need changing. So I just want to show you one kind of example of someone's idea, and I want you guys to help help them. So this person said, I'm going to pump my gray water to the top of my property, store it in two 500 gallon tanks, then gravity flow it down the hill to irrigate through a soaker hose. See any potential issues with this? It's all wrong? <laughs> you want something specific? Yeah, soaker, you guys know the soaker hoses, they, the water kind of weeps out. It's got very, very small outlets. They usually clog just with regular water. So you can imagine if you put gray water into a soaker hose, it would probably clog in like, I don't know, 30 seconds, <laughs> maybe a minute. Yeah, and the, and the top of the property, sometimes you have to pump. If you have a hill, a lot of, you know, San Francisco homes or places with hi on hills, the house is down at the bottom, all the landscaping's up at the top, you do have to pump. But usually you want to pump just the lowest amount possible. So pump to the plants you want to water, and don't pump to the top of your property and then gravity flow down. You've just kind of defeated the, the purpose of the pump. So there's another one, but I'm going to skip that one. So really um, briefly, I just wanted to show you kind of the other type of system, the more high-tech, high more complex system. If people want to irrigate lawns or lots of really small plants that do need the type of irrigation that drip irrigation performs, you're going to be looking at this other type of system. Um, it's called sand filter to drip irrigation, and these system, the cost of them really goes up, you know, $7,000, $10,000, maybe even more. They're, they're really just a lot, a lot more expensive and a lot more complex. And these pictures are from Rewater. It's one of the oldest companies that does this kind of system. They, you know, they do lawns, they do other things, and, you know, we encourage, instead of lawns, having other things that you can water. But if people need lawns with gray water, that's the other type of system you'll be looking into. And just to give you just a, a quick kind of sense of the difference in scale, here's a schematic. Um, so the gray water goes into a big a, a temporary tank called a surge tank. It's pumped out through a filter. Um, the filter's automatically cleaned, so it has to have special protection so you don't accidentally pump the gray water into the clean drinking water side. So it's called an RP, a reduced pressure backflow preventer. And some cities don't allow those, so permitting gets a lot more complex. Um, but you do have, you know, a lot of control. There's controllers that can say, oh, there's not enough gray water. I want more fresh water to come in. So you really can have just a, your gray water can be compatible with, an exi with a um, system that works like a regular drip irrigation system. So you go on vacation, it's still getting watered. The other types of systems just don't, they're, they don't have this level of complexity to them. So I just wanted to give you the, the range of that. And one example on the commercial scale, um, these, you know, systems, again, are going to be more complex. So this is an example that a, a, la a commercial laundromat is irrigating a whole kind of mini mall shopping area. This is from that company, Rewater in Chula Vista. So under that handicapped parking space, there's a big underground temporary tank that the water comes into, and then it's pumped out, filtered to the subsurface drip irrigation. So definitely possible. There's examples of big apartment buildings doing this and other areas with this other type of gray water system. Okay, 
so let's kind of do a recap of some of the, the highlights of the presentation so far. Um, you know, firstly, it's encouraging you to think about what we traditionally think of as a waste product, waste water, and finding a, a, a resource for it again or a need for it again. And um, that's the first thing, you know, thinking about gray water as a re resource saves us water, which is a scarce resource, obviously, as we know in this state, saves us money, saves us energy and chemicals that are uh, excessively used in sewage treatment plants, by the way. It encourages healthy product use. So by thinking about the relationship of, you know, for instance, what we either wash ourselves with or wash our clothes with and the relationship that has with the soil. And if you want to take it as far as what the food we eat, well, you know, that whole cycle and education and understanding will ultimately encourage us to use healthier products. We'll be more in touch with that, uh, the implications of, of such. Uh, it does get us out in our backyards, which um, I, for one, think is a good thing. Um, we're surrounded by uh, a lot of busy lives and technology, so sometimes it's, it's nice to be out there in the quiet and the peace. Um, it facilitates local food production and community, and I think this is a very important point. Um, growing food, sharing food, uh, gets us out of our uh, suburban homes and actually kind of meeting each other uh, again, which I think will be uh, an important step for us as we look into the next 10, maybe 20 years. Uh, great water could be at the heart of that. It protects our oceans and rivers. Um, it's part of the solution, as Laura said, when we looked at the 10% the uh, desalination offset, could be a significant contribution. 10% across California is not that much to ask for. So I want you to take away from this that there is something that we can do that would make a difference. Um, it redefines our relationship with water because we're educated about it. We understand where it's coming from, where it's going to, and we're making significant improvements into that whole system and, and process. Uh, it does create green jobs. Um, I think, you know, very important, obviously, from where we are as a country economically and around the world, grey water can be a huge part of that. Um, I guess I'm living proof of, of that. It's legal, it's fun, and it's inexpensive. So if nothing else has convinced you this afternoon, uh, I promise you, it is those things. All right, so on to uh, the last part of our presentation title. Obviously, we've covered uh, how grey water can green a parched state. Uh, what could you do as Googlers to help this situation? Um, I think the first part of this, obviously, we think about um, reduce, reuse, recycle. So the first part of this is, you know, just conserving water in the first place. How do we uh, make slight adjustments in our, uh, you know, lives that can reuse the, uh, reduce the water use in the first place? And that that we do use, uh, because plants love grey water, obviously we can reuse that uh, for irrigation purposes. Another idea that I want to leave with you that we have talked to, to one or two uh, inside Googlers is the opportunity here to do something with your on-site laundry facility and redirect that grey water to create uh, something beautiful and productive and wholly sustainable. Uh, I have a picture here of a very beautiful uh, established kiwi vine on a trellis. Uh, just as a suggestion, um, obviously there's potential also for uh, fruit tree orchards. Uh, taking again something that we consider a waste product and giving it value again and creating something beautiful and productive out of this. Um, so we're going to leave you with that and obviously you can let us know if that's something that uh, would be of interest with you. Um, I'm also interested if there is any other ideas uh, coming from you guys today. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, so any any other questions? Uh, you mentioned that since that's like prior to 1999, technically illegal. Does that include like things the cities were doing to install like rainwater systems, like um, irrigation and such? Like it was prior to last year, 2009. Um, there, it was possible to get a legal system. There are, you know, a few examples. There's estimated 200 legal system versus 1.6 million illegal systems. So it's not that there were none. It's just that the percentage was very small. And most of the ones that were done legally that got a permit, they had an engineer design and stamp the drawing. So it wasn't really accessible to the average person. That's why most homeowners or you know interested renters or whoever wanted to do it, they just did it and they weren't able to do it legally. So the, the ex examples you've seen, they were probably done legally, but with an engineer design stamped, which kind of removes liability from cities.
gray water from what gray water and black water, I suppose, mm -hmm. and treat it enough to use it as gray water. Um, our new subdivision is going to require to have like you know a, a clear water line and a gray water line coming into the property. Are there projects like that going on? Mm -hmm. There. Um, like this could be done at a massive scale. Any yeah. new subdivision coming in has to have gray water. Yeah, some areas like Tucson, Arizona, they have a mandate that every new construct, new building has to have, it's called a stub out, so the gray water is separate and there's a place to access it. Um, that's the only place to my knowledge it's done that. There's been talk in general plans and other places of doing that, and I believe some counties in California have done that in the past, but currently that's not just like a mass blanket thing that's happening, but it, 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 there are some examples and that's something that we should all be pushing for. For municipalities, water districts ha are supporting gray water in a few ways. There's rebates that are happening. Um, Sonoma County has some gray water rebates. There's a couple of examples, like Santa Rosa, City of Santa Rosa is. Um, San Francisco is. San Francisco is rebate. developing yeah. a rebate yeah. program. There's some examples of that happening. It's still, even though it happened last year, it's still sort of new that people can support it that way. The other answer to your question, on the large scale, there's reclaimed water or recycled water, which is different because it's all the wastewater, everything together, industry, toilets, everything goes to the plant, they treat it, then they have a higher treatment process to treat it to tertiary standards, then they pump it back through purple pipe. And that's just another, it's a, it's a different type of situation. Um, but there are, um, there, that's happening. Getting that water is, they only give it to really large water users because it's expensive to run that new pipeline back. You have here, is yeah, like reclaimed water. water, yeah. So I mean, it's possible on a massive scale. So yeah. I'm just wondering why more contributions being made to do that. I think it's the infrastructure cost. It's very expensive to when, like, if you imagine a city that's already built to get that a new pipeline, they have to dig up this, all the street everywhere and bring it back. So it's very expensive to do that, but it is happening. Gray water is a lower cost, decentralized alternative. So you can just keep the water that you're using use it appropriately, match the needs, and you don't need to treat it to that level and send it all the way over there and then all the way back. So it's a different alternative. I know that in Europe, um, they actually take gray water to flush toilets. Mm -hmm. But according to what you said, this would probably require storage, which you would not recommend. So yeah, so there's so the questions about using toilet flush, gray water for toilet flushing, and in Europe it is very common. Um, the storage, it's in a, if you're using it for outdoor irrigation, you don't want to store it, you want to just use it. For toilet flushing, there will be some temporary storage. That water is filtered, it's disinfected, so it's treated uh, to be able to be stored. So in a resident, if you're irrigating outside, there's really no reason to do that. Um, you wouldn't, so it, it depends on the context. And in Europe, there's, and in Australia too, there's companies that will sell you like a mini treatment plant that will fit like in your basement or, you know, if your apartment building in the, you know, garage, and they will treat the gray water to the quality needed to flush toilets. And there's several companies that have been very successful. Um, the regulatory climate of the United States is not very supportive yet to that. So it's kind of, we're taking baby steps. You know, if now we can do subsurface outdoor irrigation legally, and the next step will probably be indoor use with appropriate regulations in place. And for toilet flushing, rainwater is a much lower hanging fruit because it starts out so much cleaner. So mo around in this area, systems that collect rainwater, then they use it to flush toilets. That's a lot better. The, what the regulation for California residential gray water says is basically you have to treat it to the same quality as the reclaimed water plant does, and which is daily testing. And it's, it's just economically unfeasible for people right now. But that's something, again, that will be changing, I think, in the future. And you can store rainwater, so it, yeah. it kind of gives you that added advantage. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it.